just a, an experiment for the first time. We're just going to have a little t- v- little girl talk about what's going on in true crime. So I guess the biggest thing that's going on right now is um, the Watts case, right? And you're not following that, right, Alexa? Right. Like, I know everyone else is, and I feel left out, but I just can't. <laughs> it's so sad to me, and there's just no mystery in it you know like he definitely did it he admitted to doing it everyone knows he did it it's not like you know a question of if he did it or not so I just don't need to know all the horrible details I guess I think that says something good about you but there's um, a lot of online people who think that there is some mystery and that he might have had an accomplice are you are you familiar with this? <laughs> Actually, I think I've made you familiar with this uh, new theory. What do you it's think of so that? Sad. I think it's ridiculous. I think it, it, this person should, or any of these people who are saying this is crazy and they should feel bad. Yeah, just for people who don't know, there's been two major theories that have hit the internet and sort of lit up the true crime. Uh, watchers and one theory was that Bella was still alive um, because what a better way to not get noticed when you're loading up dead bodies of your family (laughs) into your truck but to keep a toddler alive at five in the morning and you know load her into the truck and have her stand outside and watch you load her mother's body and probably her sister's body into the car yeah expect her not to make any sound. Yeah, and the thing that started this theory, I I believe, by this uh, YouTuber, was that he watched the Chris Watts interview where he's asked by the, by the interrogator, the the woman who gave him the lie detector test um, that he failed, after he failed, that she asked him, and after he's confessed, she asked him if he put the girls alive into the oil tanks and he says no no god no and which to me seemed like a a real reaction but to this youtuber he thought he protests too much and he thought it was definitely that he was lying and I didn't get that feeling at all but you know what it reminded me of is you know you know even like some people with with like the worst who do the worst things in life like say mobsters still have values you know what I'm saying Right. So he may have killed his whole family, but he stops at putting them alive in an well, oil, you know, drowning them alive in oil. That's, what did the, the uh, did they like release the autopsies for the children? Yes. And what was their cause of death? It was suffocation, you know, um they were choked to, you know, choked to death, suffocated. Oh. Yeah. All of them were. He did that with uh his wife Shanann and his two children, Bella and Celeste. Like with his hands? With his hands, yeah. yeah. And one of them, the worst part of it was that one of them fought and that she had, you know, biting her tongue and marks in her <gasps> mouth from Yeah, it was really awful. Like oh, I understand. I'm sorry to you've been avoiding <laughs> it right okay, I'm sorry okay. to inform it's... you, but it's awful. It's really yeah. and I think that the fascination with it is that the Colorado um, law enforcement has released so many video, so much video of this. I've never seen so much video released on a case ever. Well, now I know why most cases, you know, they don't do it. You know, before I probably would wonder, like, why don't you just release the things? Why don't you? And apparently they probably shouldn't because 
you know, people are going to spend their entire day and night, like, going over it all and thinking that they're about to solve the case and start accusing innocent people of being involved and using their analytical, I guess, non-existent video skills <laughs> to claim they know what really happened. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that this person in England thinks he knows more than the investigators in Colorado who were on the ground and in and, interviewing these these potential suspects. And has, like, real equipment to, like, look at the video, all the surveillance video. You know, I'm sure they can blow it up and, like, make it look as, you know, good as they can. And they have, you know, all this other evidence that they're going through. And this guy on his HP a laptop over there in the UK thinks that he can see stuff on this video that apparently right, the investigators or no one in the FBI or, you know, police department over there could see. And it's so grainy. Like I watched the video that he was talking about trying to say that there was two people there. You can't tell. Like you absolutely cannot tell in that video. It was so grainy. And the one time that I thought I could tell, I was like, oh, yeah, that's a little girl. <laughs> he said, that's the image. That he, and then he cut in and said, well, that's the image of nothing there before anyone gets into the frame. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, the, the shadow video. That. Yes. So I saw it in the frame where nothing was in. in so I'm sorry. I'm just wondering if what I saw was what you saw, too, because I saw something. I'm like, oh, that could be a shadow of maybe a person. I don't know. Could be. <laughs> right. Right. That's it. But it's really scary. And this is and uh, what just for the theory that his mistress was involved. When has a mistress ever helped a her um, married boyfriend annihilate his kill his whole family? When has his that ever family. happened in history? Never. <laughs> like, you know, this tends Absolutely to happen. Never. I'm sure it's probably happened. I can think of a case where it's happened that the mistress helped kill the wife. Yes. The, the whole family with children, little, little girls, get out. Get out, right? It's not like the McDonald case, uh, which was so famous that, like, you know, and he was having a lot of affairs, too. But it's not like any of those women helped him or... It's just... Right. I, and like you said, they were all three strangled to death. So what help did she even... What help could she have been? To, you know what I mean? Like, she strangled one of them, I guess? I mean, what? what? Right. Right. It's, it's so absurd. It's really absurd. And it's scary to me. And I knew... In, in, I, I wrote a tweet about it. You can follow me at uh, Roberta Glass Pod uh, on Twitter. Because right at the beginning, when people started talking about the mistress and calling her a murderer and you know really horrible names, and I felt the pitchforkiness of it a while back. And when there were reports that she had to go into witness protection, I wasn't surprised. imagine how horrible like her life is ruined now and it really reminds me of Ken Kratz and what he went through people mm -hmm. this is like a reality show this is like entertainment for people and these are real people that that you don't know you don't know everything you know less than law enforcement a lot less a lot less and also we failed to mention that also you're not trained these are trained professionals. <laughs> right. And how dare you just like sit at home like you know you know that you don't know as much as them. Like you don't have the case file in front of you and even if you did, you haven't talked to these people. You don't know any of this. And from if I was going to ever accuse anybody of anything serious like that, I you would need to be very 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 sure. And like how could you possibly think you know you're not sure. You know you're just guessing and like maybe and there's a chance. Like so why would you attack somebody like that well and i think also there's that added element of wanting great great theories that attract views that attract patreon money and attract subscribers <laughs> yeah like you it, it, the, i mean it's not enough to just talk about the case everybody's talking about the case you are going to go through the video and find something that nobody sees you know because you know you're like what is your job like do you, i mean 
you're not even a video actor. Like, like what? Right. Well, you're... So crazy. Yeah, and you're in the problem of being an armchair detective is that you're in an armchair. You're not <laughs> there, you know? You can't see any of these people. You're not interviewing them. You can't see the evidence that, that police have. You know, it's so crazy. Like, I, I mean, it's how could you imagine being that crazy to think that you know better than the police? Yeah, but you see this often, too, with documentaries where people make people the villain, make people the good guy, and mm-hmm. it's the exact opposite in real life. Like, you know, these are pieces of propaganda, and people can't get that. They just think that they are, because it's a documentary, that it doesn't have a, a agenda, and that they're seeing things as they happened, you know? It makes and them feel like they're there. And as far as the agenda goes, okay, so you want to see the person who's making millions of dollars off making it the most compelling documentary they can, making millions of dollars off this, and you're going to believe whatever it is they say more than the cop who's making 40 grand a year trying to put people away or the prosecutor making maybe 60. Like, they have no, you know what I mean? Like, why are they going to be the one to lie and lie and lie and lie to put an innocent person away for what reason? Like, why would you think they have less integrity than a Hollywood documentary maker who's making millions of dollars off of it? And like, also, why would you think that was the honest, honest side of the story? Such a good point. And also, now with these documentaries, these defense lawyers are going on speaking tours um, and making money that way. It just, and of course, the sequel to the documentaries, you know, there was like three Paradise Lost documentaries and. You know, like I said... Now we got two making a murderer. Yeah, I picked the wrong side in life. <laughs> you know, I picked the nobody side. But, uh, you know... Well, you at least you aren't shilling for child killers. Yeah, I don't know how murderer. you could. I don't know how you could, but they have it in their mind that the child killer is the underdog and um, they're going to fight for the underdog when the real underdog is the victim. That's the underdog. Of course, yeah. Truly. I don't know. It's uh it's it's upsetting. It's really it's, it's really sad and just people really I wish would think about, you know, people's motives in this and why you know they would be making these kind of documentaries and stuff. Like why do you, I mean do you think they care about the victim or the accused? Do you think they care about them more than the person who does this for a living, you know, like that's what prosecutors and police do. They, you know, put bad people away and try to get justice for victims for a living. These documentary people try to do it, make any kind of story compelling that they can to make money. Yeah, it's true. True. I don't know how they, they, they live with themselves, but, and it's so interesting to see, you know, um, their body of work, especially um, Berlinger, who did the Paradise Lost documentaries. He goes from, you know, the West Memphis Three to other questionably um, questionable cases uh, where, you know, the person is claiming innocence. It's it, it's an entire um, movement that's these, these um, cases that are picked up by the Innocence Project, you know? Um, and so often, when they find a way to get out of prison, they hang out together. Like, you'll find oh, Jason yeah. Baldwin hanging out with Marty Tanklev, hanging out with, I mean, if I... Amanda Knox with Damien uh, Eccles. Damien Eccles, and um, what's the other case where the person is still in prison that I was thinking of? That um, Catherine Zellner got out on the Brady violation? Oh, um she got Ryan Ferguson, Ryan out, but, Ferguson. but he stuck Erickson still in there, yeah. of course, because as soon as she got Ryan Ferguson out, she, every, oh, before he got out and uh, immediately a week after, everything was all about how Chuck was going to get out and they're going to do everything they could to get him out because he's innocent. And here it is years and years and years later, and you've never heard another thing about it after, you know, he'd been out for a week. <laughs> I and, know. It's such a and problem. Chuck Erickson's never going to get out because nobody cares because they know that he's guilty. Yeah, he doesn't have the money also, you know, he doesn't have the money or the looks. That, How mad that do you think he is? He's got to be pissed. 
He's got to be so pissed. And he, and he, of course, I mean, if you really want to look at it in a dark way, he's probably the more moral of the two of them. Yeah, he's the one who had it on his <laughs> conscience, who went into the police and finally confessed because he couldn't take it anymore. Not Ryan Ferguson, I want to kill someone before I'm 21. Oh, my god! You know, that he's guy. He's so lucky they didn't find forensics on him. Because he sued the state, and one, people think that he got out because he exonerated himself with evidence. He got out on a technicality. Yeah, exactly, a technicality. (laughs) And Chuck Erickson's story, whenever Ryan finally got out, his story was that not even that, you know, Ryan didn't do it, and neither did he. His story was that Ryan was there, but he was actually the one who killed him, and Ryan just stood there and watched. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just it's not even like he <laughs> anytime they they change so their stories, I raise my eyebrows. Anyone in these cases changes their story significantly. I'm not talking especially talk- after years and yeah. lawyers are involved and money is involved. Yeah, we we don't know. We don't know what happened when a witness decides to change their story. You can see in um a murder in the park, how yeah. that happened. And it's very interesting. I really encourage everyone to watch that documentary. It was on absolutely Netflix last time I checked. I'm not sure if it's, it's still, still on there. I watched it again not that long ago. It's brilliant. Brilliant. And you really understand how they're offered book deals. Sometimes they don't get any money. They're just offered things that I'm sure never come to fruition, like movie deals, book deals, um and a lot of these people, you know, the majority of people involved in murder cases are not affluent people. You know, they're people that something very small could get them to change their story, you know, because they, you know, are in need of things. So it's very suspicious always. And it's, I think just, a yeah, a, a promise of something or just even something small can get somebody to change their story. Yeah. And <laughs> hold on. And uh, and to continue on on our conversation about bias documentaries, let's you were the one to tell me about the pardon of Centoya Brown. Yes, I, so terrible. Can you believe that? Yeah, I'm. Well, I saw the doc. I, I couldn't believe. I think you brought up some of the best points. Your text to me was. Um, you know, you always call her the, the, you make her younger than she really was, like the 13 year old oh, yeah. sex trafficking victim who, sex who killed her, her sex trafficking pimp. That's the story that they put out. So different than the reality. Uh, and even on my phone, like when I saw the, the headline on my phone's like news thing, it said, it actually said, it said, teenager who went to prison for killing sex trafficker finally gets pardoned. And then I'm like, oh, heck no. They did not put this as their headline because that's a lie. It's absolutely a lie. It was not her sex trafficker. So then I click on it, but then that's not really the headline. That's how they advertise it. But then you click on the story, and then the headline really says, uh, Centoya Brown or, you know, teenager um, convicted of murder gets um, pardoned. It takes out the whole part about killing her sex trafficker because that's not what happened. She did not kill her sex trafficker. No, and she was an adopted, um, a- adopted as a child by you know <clears throat> loving parents. Ran away to be with her boyfriend. Boyfriend cutthroat. She was doing drugs. Doing drugs, and she and he, she decided to. Um, or he is, it's very unclear why she was being, if she was being pimped out or she was choosing to prostitute herself or what that relationship was with Cutthroat. And that gets into some hairy issues, Mm -hmm. but what she told her fellow, um, prisoners was that she just wanted to see what it felt like to kill someone. And you can watch her in that documentary talk about blood coming to the floor with, no emotion at her all uh, at all falling to the floor. No and emotion. And the guy in her face. was asleep. He was asleep, and he didn't know how old she was. Did you see what she looked like back then? She wasn't wearing pigtails back then. She looked absolutely like an adult. 
he didn't know how old she was, and he was asleep, and she shot him in the head. Right, and both of us are anti-prostitution, right? I think we both have that Absolutely. position. Right, so, you know, I think my fem- my fellow, I-, I know you're not a feminist, I am, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm getting such... Um, flack in 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 my feminist circles for not supporting her and the women's march put out a tweet that if you're marching in the women's march you're marching for Centoya Brown I was like well for the right to kill people right while they're asleep and then robbing them like it's not she killed him so that she could take all of his money and all go buy money. more drugs yeah she Get went out. and she she robbed his corpse Mm-hmm. She robbed his corpse. You won't ever read about that, though, in the media, of course. Which is so often, we were just talking about that last night, so often that happens after someone like Amanda Knox went out um, lingerie shopping, the Menendez brothers went on a spending spree. So often, uh, these murderers, killing makes them want to go on spending sprees <laughs> or joy rides. Well, a lot of times they're killing for the money. So, yeah, once they get it, of course they're going to... Yeah, she didn't waste any time. That's right. She was. I think she was killing for the money, and she was killing... I believe she was killing to see what it felt like. And I think... I believe you're right. We're looking at another um, uh, situation like um, Henry Abbott, where uh, Jack Henry Abbott, who's got out after a big push by celebrities, and two weeks later, killed a waiter who talked to him in a way he thought oh, wasn't respectful yeah. enough. They got into an argument, and I, I really think she's dangerous. And I, I think mean, she, especially if she starts doing drugs again and, you know, needs money, I would not, I mean, clearly, she's capable. If you're capable at that young of an age and then spend all this time in prison, I, I would never want her to live near me. No, no. And I, someone even argued with me online. They'd love to. I said, well, when, you, when she gets released, I didn't know that she was going to be pardoned. I, I thought I was hoping she wouldn't be released. She can stay with you as your house guest. And I hope she doesn't. <laughs> and maybe you'll have the, you know, privilege of being murdered in your sleep and your corpse robbed. If she, yeah, if, she has, if you have something she might want. Yeah, but I, I get the, uh, you know, she's volatile and... She has, uh, she, she makes my blood run cold, and she is no one that, um, I hope, you know, I hope she d- doesn't decide to move into New York. Well, and everybody's support, <laughs> though, behind her is based on a whole false premise. Like, every person I've ever seen online talking about it that I've engaged with, every single one of them believes she killed her pimp and was being sex trafficked and beaten and, you know, against her will and all this stuff. And that this guy, you know, was doing all this stuff to her, and she just finally had enough one day, and while he's beating her, she snaps and shoots him. And that's, I mean, it's not even anywhere near the case. Like, the reason all these people support her is because they don't know the real story. Right. And some, yeah, I, I, it really goes back to the abuse excuse, which the first time I became familiar with that was in the Menendez brothers case, where they were saying that they were in fear for their, very similar to <sighs> Centoya Brown, she said she was in fear for her life, that he, that while he was sleeping, he was going to reach under the... She didn't say he was, admit he was sleeping, but she thought he was talking to her the way he was talking put her in fear. If you right. can listen to her tell that story and you believe her, I'm afraid for you. Don't, right. don't join any um, pyramid schemes. Right, anyway. I have a bridge I want to sell you. Right, <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid you might buy a bridge. When she <laughs> saying that and she goes to that comp um that that hearing where they're deciding whether to try her as an adult or try her as a as um a minor in pigtails too I, the pigtails is too much to, like when you see pictures of her from before you know she looks like an adult and there's no pigtails and she looks like a gangbanger honestly uh-huh but she made and, sure she looked really young and innocent for this. Yep. So she's a manipulative person. And uh, so she's telling the story that she was afraid because of the way he talked and he was going to reach under and kill him. Be- she was in fear that he was going to reach under the bed and grab a gun. And so she had to kill him. She had to shoot him in the back, you know. And um, 
while he was lying down. And but the <laughs> but the response I get from supporters is that she had such a hard life and she was so abused by everybody that she should just get a break. Yeah, except for she wasn't. Like you said, she was adopted by loving parents and she got a drug problem and a bad boyfriend and made a string of bad decisions and but that's I mean, really like a sentence, sentence, something to be considered at sentencing. I mean, we don't just let people commit crimes because they get a pass because they had a bad, hard life. Right, because right? they were, ab- right, ex- yeah, you can't, exactly. I mean, that has nothing to do with whether, you know, you have to take responsibility at some point of the things that you've done and not blame it on your childhood. You know, somebody can't just go rob a bank and then you know, get caught and then at sentencing be like, oh, but I haven't, you know, my parents were poor and I just got laid off from my job, you know, and they're like, oh, it's cool. It's fine that you did it then, you know, just go home. He needed the money, judge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. Just rob a bank and be cleared. You need the money. No problem. Right. As long as you have a reason. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, we're getting to to an age where, Nothing is anyone's fault. Everything just happens because of someone else or something else. <laughs> Zero personal accountability. I really am sounding like an old old fogey, the you know, or whatever, but I think it's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, I agree. I agree with you fully. And then you're accused of not having any compassion. Oh, but I, know. I do have I compassion. Know. I have compassion for the victim. That's who I have at compassion point, for. I do have compassion, but I don't even care. Like at this point, I just say so. Like, what does that have to do with the case? So what? Like, next. Yeah, I think these. I think I, I'd be very curious to know um, how these people felt. Um, you know, if something like this touched their their lives. You right. Know. I mean, and just yeah. What about the victim? Like, what about the victim? Well, first of all, he's completely misidentified 90% of the time in this case. Right. <laughs> and then, a child sex trafficker. I mean, no, he shouldn't have, you know, of course, I like you said, we don't, you know, condone prostitution or anybody involved in it, including him. However, or sex with a he minor. He die for it. You know, he got a prostitute who he assumed was of age, you know, because she said she wasn't looks like it and acts like it. Right. And got murdered. Right. And then the reason she feared him, she said he wanted to make love with desire. Because that's what every scary guy says. <laughs> right before they murder you. <laughs> right. I thought, oh, you should have come up. I bet he did say something like that. And I was like, I bet, you know, you, sh- you should have come up with a better line, Centoya. Someone yeah, said it to her. Like, yeah. I'm not sure not, it was him. He was choking me. He wanted to do this to me. Like, with yeah. desire? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I just want to have a romantic <laughs> evening with a prostitute. <laughs> right, he didn't treat me, you know, bad. He didn't treat me like a prostitute enough. It was mm-hmm. weird when he started treating me like a person. Yeah, it's very weird. Yeah, he fed her. I'm sorry. It was just a, a very upsetting, that that um, decision by um, the governor to pardon her. And it makes me wonder if that should even be a power that they should hold to just, when you go into a court and you sit, last time I was uh, at the Nexium hearing, I thought, you know, more people should go to court. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have open courts in America. You can go for free at any time and just watch, watch our legal system. And then, then I would think we would have less people who would, make outrageous claims that people are just railroaded for no reason. When you see the amount of work and paperwork it would take Somebody to do that. Somebody should make Kim Kardashian go do that so she stops tweeting and getting all these freaking people in an uproar to get murderers and people sentenced to life in prison, you know, out of prison. Yeah. Do you think some of these narcissists see the narcissistic quality in these murderers and relate to them? It, I honestly don't feel it's that much. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just think mm-hmm. it's somebody that has no knowledge, really, of the real case or no knowledge of the real justice system and just hears something 
and get, you know, watch the documentary, you know, watch the five minute clip about a case full of misinformation. And then rather than taking the time to really look into it, you know, and care, she's just like, oh my God, this is a travesty. Tweet, tweet, tweet. And then, you know, thinks they're doing something good. But you think later down the road they might find out and care, but I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe No, that's what it I is. think you are right because it always blows my mind the causes that these celebrities put their name behind with no thought. I think they're just so busy running 24-7 that they might not have time to look into it like they should, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous because that's how this whole Centoya Brown thing really started, like, or at least got, you know, really big, was when Kim Kardashian started tweeting about her. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. And you know Kim Kardashian didn't read the trial transcript. She doesn't look like or someone... Just go to court, you know? Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to underestimate her, but... Uh, she doesn't seem like she spends a lot of time reading the uh, trial transcripts. Right. I'm sure she's capable of reading them. Oh, just definitely. Fine, you know, but I don't think she has the time. No. Very, very strange. And so another strange thing in the world of murderers PR is Bill Cosby. Oh, yeah. That was crazy when we looked at those videos. Yeah, because I, I said, you know, I have one video on Bill Cosby, okay? And don't misunderstand me. <laughs> Benadryl. Right. It's my, I, I, I took one and a uh, half Benadryl, one. and I talked about Bill Cosby, <laughs> and I put it up, and it got, I mean, I don't get, you know, it got so few views. And it still, I think, is at less than 200 views now, even after being up for nine months, which is, you know. And you did the video w- right when, like, the trial had just happened. And it was, it was a big story. It was a big story when I did it. Yeah. All of the news. Yeah. When, they're just right, when the trial, I think, was just about to happen or whatever to explain yeah. the case and stuff. And it got no views. And I wonder, more than any other video I've ever made. It, it is challenged in the viewer department by far. By far, so and it's I, a good and it's a good thing, and it was a, a relevant topic, and it's very strange <laughs> that um, it just doesn't apparently come up, or nothing comes up when you um, type it in into YouTube besides stuff about him being innocent. Right, like if you put in Bill Cosby innocent. Um, I'll ask uh, uh, anyone who's listening to as an experiment. Put in Bill Cosby Innocent and look at the most recently uploaded videos. And there are so many videos uploaded in the past two or three months uh, saying he's innocent from channels that just started or have very little views. Like, Um, literally, it'll be the only video on the whole channel. (laughs) And (laughs) somehow they have professional equipment and they're going on and on about how he's innocent and... That, that's no case. It's the first video they've ever done, and then they never do any videos again after that. And so it was just a channel created to make this one episode, I guess, and then you, you don't see anything else. Right. And the one channel that is kind of a successful channel, I think it's called Nicole's View, she has a petition to sign for Bill Cosby. Oh, wow. I didn't even see that. <laughs> and, you know, she's really trying to start a movie. Poor Bill. Right. And I remind uh, everybody that there was a story that came out right when Bill Cosby went to prison that said that it was a report that Bill Cosby called his wife and said, get the checkbook out and write checks to anyone and everyone who could help uh, get me out of here. Right. And And can you, I mean, I don't blame him for doing that. I mean, if I was him and I was guilty of this horrific crime, you know, I would do the same thing. Right. It's just that you don't know, you, it's the uncertainty, so you, when you see these videos, you don't know who these people are, are they being paid by a PR team to make these videos? And, I, I would assume. Right, and it's definitely, you know, when you get a PR team and you're a convicted murderer, one of the things that they do is online campaigns. Twitter uh, Yeah, because that's what works, apparently. Right. Yeah, it does work, and they're trying to get the public in such an uproar behind this convicted killer 
that it will influence the legal system. It wasn't even just the Bill Cosby innocent that you type in. And then if you go to like the most recent, just typing in Bill Cosby and going to the most recent, like maybe one out of every 10 will be something that's like critical of him or thinks that maybe, yeah, he actually is guilty. The rest is always like advocacy stuff. Interesting. Really interesting. Yeah, Bill Cosby is not a convicted murderer, by the way. I'm thinking of other PR. He's a kid, um, convicted rapist. Um, so that is, I think, just kind of a, just an amazing thing to see in real time happen, to watch this kind of uh, misguided, well-moneyed PR campaign uh, come into come into the... Uh, and how well, how well it works. Yeah. Let's see how well it, really it works. it really does work. Bill Cosby, I asked, how many people do you know that think Bill Cosby is innocent? I don't know that I've ever met one. <laughs> I actually have met a few, but they're totally misinformed. They think that these women are getting a ton of money and that, you know, that it's all about money. And I was like, they don't understand that most of these women aren't getting so much as a cup of coffee. Nothing. And, you know, that's always the go-to thing is to say, like, just with, like, the Michael Jackson accusers and, you know, anytime a famous person gets accused of something, you know, by someone, it's always, well, they just want money. And it's like, okay, so somebody's saying the exact same thing about you and accusing you of the same type of crime that apparently you've been doing for decades. Right. And you just think it's really just about, I mean, nobody does that. Nobody says the same thing about you for that long. So true. And the other thing is that the, with this R. Kelly, have you been watching any of this R. Kelly? Um, I can't the, even. <laughs> yeah. I've heard about it, though. Like, I know, because even before the documentary thing came out, I've been hearing about this here and there, you know, in different news stories and stuff, that he's that kind of person. Yeah, everybody knew he was a total... A uh, sleaze, horrible person. Before I mean, let's this. not forget that it wasn't me <laughs> in the sex tape with the fifteen-year-old right. trying to say it was not him with the Soul Train Award in the background. <laughs> yeah, highly, <laughs> highly. It's another guy with a Soul Train Award. Um, right. But I, I thought what was interesting is the same argument came up with R. Kelly that this was just a way to bring the black man down. That the that he's totally innocent is the same mm-hmm. argument for Bill Cosby, and my point is, if the government is so um, excited to frame and bring down the black man, why did they let these let, let these guys go on for decades? They were so eager. And wait until they don't have any, like, they're D-list celebrities, right. basically. They waited until their power ebbed like to bring them down. Because it would be so much better. It wouldn't be, gr- it would be so much better when they're not as powerful to bring them down. Right. Like, why wouldn't they be working on, right now, like, to bring down, like, LeBron James or something, right? <laughs> yes. Like, somebody who's actually Relevant. is powerful and yeah. successful right now. Like, that would obviously make way more sense than the 80-year-old pudding guy or uh, uh, literally a D-list rapper. So true. Who was popular in the 90s. So true. (laughs) Well, I think we have had uh, a a good little discussion about all the relevant stuff uh, that's going on in true crime. I'm sure we missed some, some points, but... I really enjoyed um, talking to you, and I appreciate uh, you doing this with me. So thank you so much. Thank you.